Welcome to Unramblings, a podcast about stories and storytelling. I'm Mark, I have a background in English literature. And I'm Charlene, and I have a background in social work and psychology. This is episode two. I'd love to tell you how many, how excited we are about all the downloads that we got for episode one and all the great feedback, except that we haven't posted episode one yet. So this is episode two. We're doing a couple of books this time. Uh, we're doing Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. And we're also doing American Gods by Neil Gaiman, or just doing all the Neil Gaiman stuff. Both of these things have recently had TV adaptations done of them. We are going to do our best not to talk about those on this particular podcast. We might at a later date do something where we look at an individual text and its adaptation. But today we're just going to look at the two books and how they portray some things differently and how they portray some things the same way. I think it's going to be interesting given that one of the authors is the same for both books. But I think there's a decent number of distinctions in how things are portrayed. Anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. General spoiler warning, we're going to talk about the full plot of American Gods and the full plot of Good Omens, to varying degrees. If we have any specific spoiler warnings, we're going to drop those in here. Hello, it's us from the future. Very few spoiler warnings to add this time, mostly it's just the two books and the TV series that go along with them. Um, there is also a small spoiler for the uh, short story Monarch of the Glen that is only in the fun facts, so if you want to avoid that, just turn it off when you get there. Uh, while I have you, I do want to take one moment to say something we forgot to say at the end of the episode, which is if you can please rate, review, and subscribe to us on whatever platform you listen on, it really helps other people to find the show. And now I'll go ahead and give some content warnings. Again, there's not a whole lot to add here, but um, rape does come up a couple of times in the podcast. We do not discuss it in graphic terms, um, but it is something that comes up in case you're sensitive to that. I think that's pretty much it. Now back to us from earlier recording. And welcome back, In the, if there were any spoiler warnings. If not, then that was just a weird period of silence for you, and we're going to move on from there. So you want me to do the brief summary after last time, when I did such a long summary that you cut me off and did a brief summary for me. Is that because you're going to do exactly the same thing again? It's because you'll never get better with that practice. It's a little patronizing. <laughs> Okay, so a uh, quick summary of each of these stories for those of you who either have read them but might not have read them recently, for, or for people who haven't read it but don't care about spoilers. Okay, so in Good Omens, the Antichrist is born, and through hilarious hijinks is accidentally given to a family of peaceful Brits who live in a quiet Oxfordshire town, instead of given to some damn Americans that are supposed to raise them to be properly aggressive, I guess. And then an angel and a demon team up to try and stop the apocalypse because they actually quite like Earth after all, and you know it has wine and books. And, you know, I can relate. That's fine. Was that okay for you? It wasn't too long for me, Andrew. You don't want to do your own one. So far, they've just been listening to me this whole time. You want to do Good Omens? Don't do American Gods. Either. Okay. American Gods is a book about a man named Shadow Moon, well, nicknamed Shadow Moon, who is released from prison after committing a robbery on behalf of his wife, only to find that his wife has died right before he was released, and he gets ensnared in the weird shenanigans of a man called Mr. Wednesday. Um, and over the course of the book, you find out that Mr. Wednesday is the American version of Odin, the Norse god, and Shadow is actually his son, but he did not know this, and Wednesday, along with Loki, the American version of Loki, are pulling a long con to trick the new gods of America and the old gods who were brought over to America from the old country to fight in their name and restore Odin and Loki to power. However, Shadow realizes what's going on and thwarts the plot. But that's essentially what happens. That is essentially what happens. It's one of those things of like, I read the, I was brushing up on the plot summary for Good Omens and was like, oh yeah, this is a pretty simple plot. And then I was brushing up on the plot summary for American Gods and was like, oh, I know why this is a long book. Yeah, the American Gods is a very convoluted story and... For a very long time, the plot seems to be very different than what the plot actually is, because, as stated, the plot is a long con. <laughs> so, it, by design, is not what it at first appears to be. Yep. So, as far as preparation for this episode, these are both books that we read relatively recently, partially because the TV series for each one just came out. 
well, it's currently coming out. Um, came out in the last couple of years. Yeah, Good Omens. We what read that reread that right before it came out, and then uh, American Gods. We well, I read it for the first time before season one came out, which we watched in two thousand seven. So two years ago. Two thousand seven was a lot more than two years ago. Two seventeen. Sorry, two thousand seventeen. So a couple of years ago. Yeah, and we haven't yet seen season two yet. So we might talk a little bit about season one, but we're probably not going to talk about season two because we haven't seen it anyway. And then we've done some brushing up, just you know, re- reminding ourselves of the plot and things on that. Um, so. I do want to mention that at least on my end of brushing up on these books, I read through the summary and tropes list for on tvtropes.org for both of the books because I felt like that really gave a comprehensive uh, reminder of a lot of the storytelling elements that are in both of those books. And we'll link tvtropes.org in the show notes. Okay. I read some plot summaries and read a character list for American Gods, which just takes a long time to read. <laughs> okay, shall we get into it? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is the sort of theme of nature versus nurture that I think informs a lot of the plots. So in Good Omens, you obviously have um, Adam, the Antichrist figure, who is literally the Antichrist, not just a figure. But when he gets given to this, like, peaceful English town and has this idyllic life growing up in the countryside and playing in the woods, when it comes down to it, what he really wants is, you know, a nice dog and some friends and pleasant weather all year round. Or, like, appropriate appropriate weather. Appropriate weather. In the winter, it should snow. As people who live in Georgia, we know that that doesn't always happen and it's very sad and it's not Christmas without snow. According to Mark, I grew up in Southern California and have very different ideas of appropriate holiday time weather. It should be warm all the time. Similarly, like, we have Crowley and Aziraphale. Aziraphale, like, learns to love Earth and humans and really enjoys being there, which is not what he's supposed to do, but it's perhaps not too much departure for an angel to be like, you know what I like? I liked bookshops. That's fine. But then when you have Crowley, who also is supposed to be a demon and torturing everyone and is like, no, this place is kind of okay. After 6,000 years of hanging around Earth, they get to a point where they're like, no, this is what we're intended to be and what we're expected to be is one thing, but what we want is something different and sort of going against that sort of inherent nature that they're supposed to have. Do you have anything to add to that before I get into the American cop side of it? I will say that it's explicitly pointed out toward the end, I believe, of Good Omens that they shouldn't have actually been that surprised that Adam ended up being a good person because his father was an angel. So, like, genetically he's an angel, or he's half angel, Mm. and expecting him to be evil is like expecting a mouse whose tail you cut off to have babies with no tails. It's this Lamarckian idea that he would inherit the consequences of his father's choices which just doesn't actually follow in any other genetic context on earth yeah and so they're like well i mean he is half angel basically so when put in an environment where he's shaped by completely different forces than other angels or his father were he's going to develop you know on in his own way basically Mm. so i thought that was neat because they do explicitly call out the nature versus nurture thing and the the fallacy that the idea of him being an antichrist is predicated on yeah which i guess like when you pull that into the crowley side of things as well who's also originally an angel and Mm -hmm. i believe the line is didn't exactly fall so much as sauntered gently downwards vaguely sauntered vaguely downwards sauntered vaguely downwards yes but still like there's the expectations that you've attributed to someone right and i do think that those kind of prejudices do come up a lot of times in the in good omens and also in american gods as we'll talk about but particularly like aziraphale says something along the lines of that he didn't realize demons had the capacity to do good things Mm. or to be nice but you see Crowley do nice things a lot, especially in the context of his friendship with Aziraphale. And again, when you get right down to that and think about the fact that, no, all demons are angels. That's what they start out as, and there's no reason to believe that they wouldn't retain some capacity from that state. But Crowley does say the opposite of Aziraphale as well. They didn't um, think that they could do anything bad. Right, which again gives the lie to this idea, well, of course they can. How else would they fall? Yeah. How else would they become demons unless they had that capacity to be to do bad things? Yeah, a lot of the book is about assuming that there's a binary on things. That Adam is either pure evil or not. 
and the, the the same goes for a zero fail and Crowley. So I thought that was interesting, um, and I think it does say something about Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's worldview on perceptions of people and how we treat people in our society. That nothing's that black and white. Especially when you then get into Neil Gaiman's commentary yeah. on such things in American Gods. So, I mean, the most obvious one is uh, Shadow, who is a son of a god and is sort of expected to... Fulfill certain tropes. Right. Supposed to feel certain ways about people. Odin and Loki expect him to play ball to a certain degree, but he has grown up around people and, you know, has hatred for lots of things in the world, but doesn't necessarily, hasn't developed any particular love for his family on that side. Additionally, he's a black man who opens the story in jail, and no one in the story seems terribly surprised by this, it's just what they expect of him, or who they perceive his nature as, but he shows multiple times over that he's a good guy, who just got kind of screwed over by the people that were supposed to be on his side, and then landed him in jail for taking the rap. Well, there are a lot of conclusions people draw about him that are raised throughout the book as being wrong, um, and also that he just sort of lets people believe about him. It's repeatedly mentioned that like he is a large, imposing-looking man that's probably partially made more of a thing because he is a black man in the United States, and there is a lot of baggage in the American perspective of uh, being intimidated by people of color, and especially large men of color. And he is often perceived as being less intelligent than other people he's around, often like white people he's around. And he's happy to let people think he's dumb, think that he's just the big dumb muscle, because it gives him, you know, a little bit more you know, freedom to just sort of listen and see what's going on and see what people do when they don't think that anyone around has the capacity to, you know, be a threat to them or, or critically evaluate them in some way. It would be interesting to see how he came across in a book from someone else's perspective because he is so quiet in a lot of scenes. Like, there's a lot of times when people are talking to him and saying things to him and he just sort of stands there silently, as you say, letting them think what they want to think. Mm -hmm. And then like you only know from because you're seeing the inside of his head what he's thinking about that situation. And at the end of the book he goes and sees Icelandic Odin. Mm -hmm. He's a very different person who's much more sort of sedate and says of Shadow blames him for American Odin's crimes. And he's like, he's me, but I'm not him. Like American Odin was born he's from... He was me, but I am not him. Right. It's like American Odin was born from him, but became much more of a con man within the nurture of the American psyche. Which, you know, I point out that Neil Gaiman's an English writer talking about the American psyche. Sure. Uh, which, you know, I would have no commentary on whatsoever <laughs> living in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, and also Icelandic Odin is amused by a sleight of hand trick, which suggests that he's less familiar with them, whereas American Odin I, you know, is... Very well acquainted with sleight and hand and such, so it shows that because Loki is the more traditional trickster god, it's the American Odin has become more of a trickster and the kind of person to play a long con than his original identity. It's part of that whole idea of nurture that you're talking about, where the strategies that are effective in a new environment and that um, you know become the strategies that you adopt more and more, and that's something that's very much lampshaded at the very beginning because there's this story that Loki Lysmith who's actually Loki, <gasps> um, tell, who is um, Shadow's cellmate at the beginning of the book, tells Shadow about not pissing people off in airports. And it's this long and convoluted story of how he ended up in jail after having been released from jail, how he got back into jail back, you know, doing stupid things. And it starts by pissing off a person at an airport. And Shadow is like, okay, so what you're saying is the specialized set of behaviors that are helpful and relevant in one specialized circumstance like jail are not adaptive in another environment like the world at large. And Loki is like, no, the point is don't piss off the people who work in airports. And so it is very much like lampshading that whole idea that just because something is effective in one environment doesn't mean it's effective in every environment. Yeah. Yeah, so it just kind of seems like Loki and Odin 
ended up being somewhat distilled down to the one aspect of their former selves that remained effective in keeping them afloat in this new environment because they were much more nuanced gods and now they are pretty much entirely a trickster duo of gods. Which I think probably is speaking to what the people that believed in them needed them to be in this new American world. They came over in these positions. They needed to hustle. Yeah, um, I mean, the you get the opening scene where, like, the first people landing on the shores of America get attracted by the natives um, and don't fare well. But with the sort of growing of cities and, like, the need to make a way, I think that there's this... America has for a long while been a place where you need to make it on your own to an extent, regardless of what the American dream is supposed to be. You can be anything, but you have to use your own route roots to get there I guess. Mm -hmm. I think it says something interesting that both in Good Omens and American Gods they seem to be laying down relatively heavily this idea of who you were, who you're supposed to be doesn't matter. Where you come from. Where you come from. It it doesn't matter. You, You can lay that aside and be whoever you need to be. I don't know if they're saying that you can lay it aside but that it's not the be all and end all of who you end up being. Yeah. You know, that those are that only gets you so far or only determines certain things. Like Adam is still a cosmically powerful entity with the ability to entirely change the entire world through his sheer force of will. And that's something that he comes to by nature of his being descended from, you know, an angel from the adversary. But that ability to shape the world, he has the ability to shape the world, but that doesn't mean he has to use it the way that his ancestors would or want him to or think he should. Yeah. So do you have a big point you want to talk about or should I go on to my next one? I do have a thing on here where I noticed that both of the books end up circling around the way that advances in technology and resources ends up changing both the boogeymen and the values that humanity I think that might holds. tie in really well with something I'm going to say in a little bit. Okay, so we should circle back to it? If we can. One of the other themes that I noticed in the book was that they both seem to be arguing that there's been a change in values from a more community-oriented perspective to a more individual, individualistic perspective in both books. So in American Gods, that's very obvious because the old gods are dying because the communities that worship them and the traditions through which they were worshipped are dying away. Fewer and fewer people are passing that on, and people are more focused on concepts and commodities that help them in the moment and are more short-term and single-person focused things like technology and things like that. And so you see the way that the different gods have had to adapt to less community-oriented environments. And then in Good Omens, you see a similar thing where Adam and Aziraphale and Crowley are all kind of trying to break away from the perspective their communities think they should conform to, to be their own people. Yeah, and I think that ties in very well with one of the things I was going to talk about, which is that there seems to be just generally a loss of faith within the books. I mean, it's very obvious in American Gods, they've got all the old gods weakening because all the attention is going to the new event- inventions that you're talking about and you, you know. Mm-hmm start caring less about the old world gods and start focusing more on worshipping mm-hmm. the internet. And somewhat conspicuously to Christianity. Like Conspicuously yes. not mentioned in American Gods much is Christianity as well. Yeah. The faith that still exists that you see that's come across for the old gods seems to almost be more of a habit than an actual belief system. Like you see a few people that do believe in the old gods but they have an interaction with them and seem very surprised that they're there. I think it was, to talk about the adaptation, I think it was done very well in season one where there's the woman who falls off her steps trying to get a jar down and has the conversation with Mr. Rivers that turns up or is it Jackal? It's one of them, I can't remember. Okay. I think it's Anubis, which is Jackal. Yeah. Seems very surprised that a god of death has turned up to collect her. The conversation in the diner, I think, is one of the biggest ones, where Wednesday is trying to recruit Easter to his side, and he's like, yeah, you're pretty healthy because people are still observing your rituals, but they don't actually know those rituals are about you. And he asks the waitress about what Easter means, and she's like, oh, I'm a pagan, I don't, that's a Christian holiday, and it's like pointing out to Easter that even the pagans are attributing her holiday to Christianity and not recognizing the origin. 
And I think that like there's a lot of stuff where the stuff there is the Easter celebrations are a lot more about the feast and stuff, which is the pagan tradition, but on the Christian route. I, I actually have my note under this is Easter picks up a lot of power from tangential support of materialism. Mm-hmm. So. Easter egg hunts. Yeah. You have the cab driver who picks up the gin and ends up swapping places with him. But the belief that he has there is, again, it's that sort of surprise, like, oh, I've carried this belief over here, but it was, again, more of a habit. Also, in Good Omens, you see very few believers. There are some human characters, but none of them spend a whole lot of time talking about gods. You get the image of, like, admittedly, it's for the Satanists. The the Satanic Nuns? Yes. You have the Satanic Nuns, but they it ends up being an empty convent by the... Like, but so even that sort of worship of the devil is disappearing. I think that that's excellent because the description of the nuns and their religious practice is like a punch clock type of worship yeah. in, on its own where it's like, no, they're, none of them are really bad people. They go, they do the chants and the rituals and they go home. Like right. they're not actually trying to foment evil or anything in their everyday lives. They are no more faithful or observant or devoted in their religious beliefs than a lot of Sunday Christians. Right. And the thing that has taken the place for one of the Satanic nuns when she stopped worshipping devils was to run a corporate retreat, which is that same sort of drifting into materialism and the modern day bullshit. But it sort of all comes across as sort of perfunctory. And, like, you do have a few other things of belief in Supernatural. Like, you have the Witchfinders, but there's sort of one and a half of those, and they seem to have sort of lost the plot at this point. You have the Psychic that lives across the corridor from Shadwell. Who definitely doesn't believe in Psychic Phenomenon. Right. She might have had a couple of experiences once, but when Fail turns up, she's very surprised, and before that was composing a shopping list in her head instead of giving the Psychic reading that people expected to. The only, like, true full-on believer in anything seems to be Agnes, who's an outcast. Agnes Nutter, the prophet? No, sorry, not Agnes. Um, Anathema? Anathema, yes. Who, like, has very good reason to believe. She's been given empirical evidence. Right, and at that point, can you even really call it faith? And I, I don't think you can. She's She is a true believer, but that's like, I believe that the sun will rise tomorrow. My entire life, it has predictably done that. Her entire life, her and her family have studied this book of prophecies and they have always been relevant and true. Yeah. So at that point, yeah, it's not faith, but it is belief. Yeah. Also, she's the only person that seems to have any of concern for the environment in the entire book, which is morally concerned. Uh. And she passes that on to Adam, which ends up being really important with, again, his world-shaping abilities. Yeah. But you have all this loss of faith that sort of leads into the question of what are people believing in now? And I mean, in American Gods, that's pretty explicitly the plot of the book, so that's fairly obvious with the rise of the new gods of internet and media. But it's interesting that that does seem to also appear to some degree in Good Omens as well. You have, as I mentioned, the satanic nun that starts running corporate business stuff and seems to have devoted herself fairly solidly to that. But you have the uh, new iterations of the horsemen that sort of have a similar... It's not so much what the people are worshipping now, so much as what they're afraid of now. Pestilence has become pollution because penicillin was involved and... Plagues became much less of a thing. And pestilence retires, making some snarky comments as he does so. And similarly, like, war becomes a war correspondent instead of an arms dealer because... Most people are now experiencing war through their TV sets and through, I mean, I guess when the book is written through newspapers, probably less so today. But it's how that fear is pushed. The majority of people are experiencing war through not the front lines. They're not necessarily even know someone that's in the military, but most people see on their phones and on their TVs what's going on with war, especially when you consider this was written in the late 80s. So you're only, what, 20 years post-Vietnam? But you're also, you also have to consider it's not even just that the population is getting their fear of war through the media, but also that war itself is being pushed and fomented through things like propaganda and biased mm. coverage. And I think that is one of the really, one of the most important aspects of war is that what she has her hands in causes conflicts and you know, pushes things that would have been pretty peaceful into 
a war and then it's justified afterward. And so when you see that, you know, she's a war correspondent, so you have to think like what politicians and diplomats are hearing her reports and getting really pissed irrationally and making reckless and violent decisions to escalate a conflict or start one that wasn't even a thing. Yeah, that's a fair point. That um, also ties in really well to the whole famine, how famine has changed in what he looks like and what he does, because in this age of abundance, we're not afraid of not having food, we're afraid of getting fat, and we're afraid of being unhealthy. And so you can starve and develop a lot of the horrible diseases that are vitamin deficiencies, basically, that people used to develop because they didn't have access to foods to prevent that. And now you can get them by eating a diet entirely of like French fries and ramen for your entire life. And so it's not that you don't have food, it's that you don't have quality food that is actually healthy for you. Yeah, I mean, he's also a dietitian, and I think effectively becomes the god of eating disorders in general. Oh, definitely. Uh, of eating disorders and obesity. Yeah. And I mean, as long as we've done the other three, we'll say, and they make death a biker, which wouldn't quite so much be um, a you know a modern sign of death, if not for the fact that one of the most visceral scenes in the book is the group of bikers that violently die because they're, yeah. But there's also, it's not even just that the, the bikers that end up following the four bikers of the apocalypse uh, to the not on Armageddon showdown. It's also that one of the leading causes of death in this country and a lot of other countries is automobile accidents yeah. and the most vulnerable people on the road are there's an entire class of like vulnerable people on the road and it's people who are on motorcyclists bikes and pedestrians so that is an interesting aspect that i'm not sure was necessarily intentional but it's interesting anyway it's an interesting commentary on things that you have that combination of a complete lack of overt faith in the books you don't ever see anyone praying to someone in Good Omens. And in American Gods, people are largely tricked into praying to people, whether it's with that... Tricked or manipulated. Yeah, the memorable scene near the start of the book with the... Uh... Bilkis. Bilkis, yes. If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Or if you've seen the adaptation, they put that in there, which is interesting. Um... Well, I... Some of the things I was reading about American Gods to brush up on this, apparently it was intentionally, like Neil Gaiman intentionally included that scene close to the beginning of the book as a gatekeeping scene mm. to sort of filter people, to sort of filter the audience down to the people who would actually be able to engage with the material further on. Interesting. Hmm. It's like, if this puts you off, it's probably for the best that you stop now before investing too much, in, you know, into this Whereas if you can get through that and you're still interested in seeing what's going on, you'll be able to accept the weird and messed up things that I'm about to show you. That scene is really weird. I think the one that makes me most uncomfortable is the god that gets run over multiple times, but maybe that's just a personal feeling way. But anyway. But yeah, I mean, the thing is that they don't necessarily ever portray it as a bad thing that these people don't have these old faiths, faiths anymore. It's a shift that they describe. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe in American Gods it's demonstrated as more of a bad thing, except for the fact that it ends up being the two of the old gods are the bad guys. Right. That the if, you know, bad guys might be a little bit simplistic to the book. But. Yeah, the depiction of it initially as, oh, it's so terrible that people have lost their faith, is the product of an unreliable narration, or, you know, not necessarily even... Wednesday's not really narrating, but, you know, an unreliable partnership in the beginning of the book. Yeah. and. As it goes on, you see that that's a biased perspective of the bad guy of like, it's not actually that, oh, it's so terrible that people have lost their faith. It's that, oh, it's so terrible for me that right. people have lost their faith. And what am I going to do about this? I being specifically Odin and Loki, you know, as two old gods who are you know, viscerally aware of, of their dwindling power in modern America. I think you're right in that it's not really not really implied that it's actually a bad thing that people are losing their faith. It's more that it is a fact of the reality that faith and belief in these kinds of structured religious and mythological systems is dwindling. And I'm not sure that it's shown as a bad thing in Good Omens either. It's, it's a thing that has happened. It doesn't seem to have a big of impact on anyone in particular. Crowley and Aziraphale talk about their attempting to get people to do good or bad things. 
or not attempting to do that, depending on how they're feeling that day. But really, people's beliefs aren't even brought up that much. It's just the, the setting for the story. I don't know, it's interesting. Along that, those lines, it's interesting to see how that apathy toward these religious philosophies kind of infects Xerophil and Crowley. Like, they are also becoming increasingly disconnected to the belief system that they're a part of. They become increasingly disconnected from their jobs and their roles as forces on Earth and just sort of are phoning it in, yeah. as it were, because as the population has gotten less invested in these ideas, it seems to be less meaningful to, even to them. It's like, what's even the point? You're just going to counter whatever I do anyway, so whatever. <laughs> like, what does this even matter? Right. And people are good enough at doing good and bad on their own anyway. Like, that's something that's repeatedly raised in Good Omens, that humans are capable of greater evil and truer virtue than the than any angel or demon. And I think it comes down to the, maybe this is a stretch, but the nature and nurture thing again, where it's without the religion, people will be who they are. And as it turns out, that that's largely fine. It's that whole thing about the, I forget who it was that quoted it, but the like, oh, without religion. Pen, what? Pendulette. Oh, yeah. P Pendulette's response to without religion, you know, what's to stop you raping and murdering as much as you want? And he said, I do rape and murder as much as I want. That amount is zero. Right, because people are capable of being good or bad without the influences of a religious philosophy. You mentioned earlier about um, moving from a sort of community situation to more of an individualism thing, which I think is interesting. I don't know how much that relates to how people are worshipping, but with Adam, I would say that he's doing more the opposite because his decision not to or like decision to try and fight against the apocalypse is kind of driven by not wanting to lose his community he's like well i could be all powerful and rule the world but what fun would that be if i was by myself like his value when it comes down to it is his community his family on earth his friends mm -hmm. and he's pushing against that individualism i think that is definitely one way to see it but you could also see that as him choosing one community over another based on his like drive to be an individual and his perception of himself as an individual who can make their own choices, somebody with free will. Because he is rebelling against a community that he was never part of, a community that considered him part of it, but that he was never actually included in. Mm -hmm. So he was the son of the adversary, and has this like crazy long name that includes like destroying of worlds and stuff. And this community of demons and angels have been trying to manipulate his life for his entire life, but they never actually engaged with him as a human being. They or as a I guess that's a uh, poor choice of words. They never actually engaged with him as an individual and as an entity in his own right. And so the community that he became attached to was the human community that he was raised in. Mm. And while, yes, that is still a very community-centered perspective, it's also him rebelling from the community that had plans for him and that viewed him as having obligations to them to pursue his own, his own free will, his own drives and values. Which I guess is exactly the same thing that Aziraphale and Crowley are doing. Yes. It's pushing against their positions as angels and demons and going, why not this, this community of humans? They're, they're kind of fun. Exactly. And, and it makes sense because, again, they've been kind of put in a very similar position where they have these larger communities that they came from who has these expectations of them but isn't actually spending any time with them substantially or bothering to know them as individuals. And so the only people who they know and interact with in any sort of substantial way and actually have a real connection to are each other, which pulls them further away from their respective sides because of their their very individual, you know, the friendship that they have as individuals. I think that's interesting in, in uh, Good Omens. And then of course you see that reflected on a more macro level with American Gods, where it's just everybody is choosing their individual needs and practices and what's going to help them in their particular microcosm uh, over any sort of larger community orientation. And at the end of the book, Shadow does kind of reject all of that and like goes, goes a wandering, for example, ends up in Iceland talking to Icelandic Odin. Right. Decides he needs to find out who he is as an individual now that he knows more about the baggage of where he came from. Yeah, and now that his wife is dead again. 
Yeah, now that his wife is dead again, now that he knows who his father is, now that he knows that he's got some sort of weird sun god thing going on, like, he wants to know what that means. Like, who who is he as a human and as a god, as an entity? It means he can pull gold coins out of the air. Apparently. And be resurrected. Both useful talents. Yes. So, have we talked about, like, the big things in these stories that we're seeing? Yeah, I've got a, a little thing. I think you said you've got a couple of little things. I've got things a couple of little things. So we can things. just sort of touch on quickly. Yeah. Do you want to go first? I, I've sure. been hugging everything else. So. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that in both of these stories, you have this very clear both sides are the same trope being played out, where mm. in American Gods, the old gods and the new gods are really, they're pretty much the same. They're both terrified of becoming obsolete and forgotten and losing power and being consigned to oblivion as people move on to the newer, flashier idea of the time. And that is very important at the end when, like, the showdown ends up being cancelled because it turns out both the old and the new gods are being played by Loki and Odin. They're playing both sides the whole time, and when Shadow reveals this, they're like, oh, well, this is dumb then, and we're gonna just do our own thing. And so that's pretty, pretty interesting. And then, of course, in Good Omens, you have it where the angels and demons are pretty much the same on both sides of the conflict. They're even... It's even described like when everyone is masked, all the demons are masked, all the angels are masked. It's even stated that it's pretty much impossible to tell them apart masked like that because they're all actually from the same place. They're all actually from the same stock and they're all doing the same thing. You have that parallel in the description of what Aziraphale and Crowley are doing for thousands of years. The two of them just sort of make tiny impacts on the world one way or the other but no one does any major stuff and the balance pretty much stays the same. It's even joked frequently that the things that they get a lot of credit for from their respective superiors are actually things that humans have done on their own power with no influence from either of them. So, you know, you definitely have this idea of them both phoning it in in like the exact same way and not actually caring that much about the outcome. When Aziraphale and Crowley try and talk to their superiors about I mean, do we really want an apocalypse? You know, how, who does that really serve? What's the point in that? Both sides have exactly the same response of, no, we're doing this because it's what we're supposed to do in this very dogged, uh, lawful good, lawful evil kind of way. At the uh, risk of dating this, Brexit means Brexit. Yeah. Anyway. Right, so there's, I... the, so yeah, both sides are the same. Yeah, and the playing both sides comes through in Good Omens, I think, in a weird way, where you have that same final showdown that doesn't really happen, because I think there's an idea of both sides being played off against each other, but there's an extent to which in that one there's the hint at the end that maybe God's plan, God's ineffable plan, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. God's ineffable plan, like, was always for things to go exactly as they did, and, like, both sides think that they're making all their own choices, but really they're, they're being played. Right. It, the joke is that it's actually a complicated game of solitaire. It's not a game of chess because God is running all of it. So they're all on the same side. They're all on God's side. It's just, you know, he's playing a game with himself over a long period of time. You can say he if you want. Well, they do in the book. Do they? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, so they're literally both the same side in that they're both executing the same plan. Um, you also have the playing both sides with, of course, American Gods, where Loki, everyone is on Loki and Mr. Ro um, you know, Odin and Loki's side, with Loki being, you know, also Mr. World, the head of the new gods, and Wednesday marshalling the old gods, but it's really a whole con being orchestrated by Loki and Loki, uh, Loki and Odin. Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on the way the narration's done in the books quickly. Partially because you bring it up there, is in Good Omens you get this sort of omniscient god narrator that knows everything that's going on, which actually the narration is fairly pulled fairly verbatim for the TV series, and the narrator that's doing it is actually credited as god slash narrator. And is also a woman, which... Was Gaiman's choice there, so you'll comment about the he in the books. I don't know, maybe, maybe I misremembered that. No, maybe. 
Don't worry, they use he and everything else in cult culture. Yeah, um, I think that God's referred to as he at some point in the book. I don't know. Yeah, I think you might be right. But uh, then in Good Omens, a lot more of the narration is through that sort of folklore type style of talking, and a lot of the narrative bits that you get outside of that are literally accounts written down by uh, Mr. Ibis mm -hmm. or Thoth, depending on which name you want to go with. So you, in the, you get the narration styles that fit the particular style of God that's most prevalent in each book, which I just thought was kind of interesting. Or in, in each chapter? Well, no, because in, oh, in, cause in Good Omens you get this sort of individual God narrator that knows everything, and then in American Gods you get the, the little bits of folklore and the tales that go along with each of the gods. So it was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I, I also think that that also helps the, the narration in American Gods is this sort of third person narration that also plays a large role in the misdirection that's very important in the entire book because you only get the you only get the information in that that, that the third person narrator relays to you, which a lot of it is from Shadow's perspective filtered by what Wednesday chooses to tell him and what his experiences are. And of course, we know that Wednesday is a master manipulator and is, you know, orchestrating this whole situation um, to play everyone off of each other for mm -hmm. his own supremacy. Whereas you don't have any sort of nefarious mastermind as explicitly in Good Omens. The misdirection there is is more incidental. You think we're gearing up for an apocalypse, and then it's subverted. You know, whereas before you think we're gearing up for a big war, and it turns out to be the let's you and him fight trope. Yes. Throw me outside of this mountain. <laughs> cool. Anything else on your list? No, I think those were those were pretty much all the things that I had. I am amused that they both end with the showdown just sort of fizzling out and not happening. It's like um, some new information comes out and everyone just takes their ball and goes home. <laughs> okay, so I think if we've touched on all of the smaller things that we want to talk about, there is the big question that these two works ask, which is what is the nature of the human to divine relationship in these books? And by divine, I'm really meaning supernatural, but it's so, so God and deities, but also angels and demons. And Yeah, yeah, I, I, see, I see what you mean. I definitely see that question relevant to both of these books. The answer I would give is probably, you know, not surprising given my background as a psychologist, where, you know, the... There's a pretty strong idea in psychology and anthropology that religion and mythologies and concepts like gods and demons are a part of how humans make sense of the parts of the world that are hard to explain. You know, the that answer the questions like why do bad things happen to good people, you know, that or that serve some other adaptive function in a society. So you have these myths of these demons and things that, you know, snatch children who are in the dark forests at night without their parents and, you know, things like that are, you know, tales that get passed on because they help kids survive because then they're too scared to go in the woods at night, which is a good thing because of predators, not necessarily because of kobolds, which I'm specifically referencing because of, of good omens. There's the kobold who sacrifices children. Mm. Um, so the nature of the human and the divine relationship is that humans look to and make up divine entities and rely on divine entities to reassure them about the world in ways that other things can't. Do you think that they do in the books, though? Well, I think that a big part of the central conflict in the books is that over time, humans have started doing that less and less, and they're starting to look to other things to comfort them. like. I think it really does come down to like what's the nature of the relationship between humans and the divine. It's that humans look to the divine as a comfort or as a way of making the world clearer. And in a world where we have search engines and, you know, one day shipping and, you know, things like that, we don't need some system of ideas outside of ourselves to comfort us or explain parts of the world that are confusing. 
I might argue that in the books, the way that the gods and various entities are described, like, maybe there's a reason that people aren't worshipping them so much anymore. Because with the exception of Crowley, Aziraphale, and maybe Shadow, they are they all seem extremely self-interested. Like, they don't seem to actually care about doing good things for humans. They care about what the humans can do for them or what their what own house. Adam? I mean, even Adam's decisions are self-motivated, but he's also a child. I hadn't really thought about him. But, like, the angels and demons, all they really care about is that, you know, if we have the apocalypse, we don't have to worry about Earth anymore and we can have our own fun times. And then in American Gods, like, obviously Odin and Loki... All their motivation is, how can I get more power? And, Screw all you guys as long as I get mine. Right. And then all, all the other deities are either in a position where they're on the up and they're like, well, I don't have anything to complain about. This is great. And like, screw you guys. Or they're on like the dying out end of things and they're like, eh, it is what it is. We, we had our time. And Odin comes to them and is like, we should do the thing. And they're like, no. They, they've given up. Or they're self-interested. Nobody's out there going, ah, but i got to go represent my people. They're all about what do we take from people. I think there's some stuff in there that I agree with, but also other things that I don't. So I think that in American gods in particular, the gods in the tradition of most gods from human mythologies represent some of the best and worst things of humans. And a lot of them are really terrible by by human standards, especially, like, Odin is a horrible rapist. Like, he's constantly charming girls, not only to find him really attractive and sleep with him, but also to never be able to love anyone else the entire rest of their lives, which is just objectively a horrible thing to do, especially when you consider that he's essentially spreading a, a plague of that throughout the world, given that he seems to find a new virgin to do this to about every day. But you also have the good parts of the gods, too, of like similar to the good parts of humanity, like, like Anubis and Thoth don't seem to be particularly bad guys. And in all their interactions with humans, they seem to be pretty caring and reassuring. Like what they do okay. is shepherd people through some of the worst times of their lives as undertakers. So that's, you do see both parts of that. But I, I definitely see your point about a lot of the gods having this perspective of seeing humans as essentially like a food source or, you know, a, a source of, for their survival. And much the same with good omens and American gods, seeing humans as pawns to elevate them in a certain way. By winning this battle, we will finally show the demons what for, or we'll finally take back our place in heaven as the side, maybe. To challenge your point on the Anubis and Thoth, taking care of people. I think that they're more in the same boat as like internet and media of not having to worry about things. It's like, you know, become an undertaker and you'll never be out of work. Like they're, they're not in their heyday, but they're also not really wanting for much. They're fairly comfortable. I do see your point, but maybe your example wasn't the best. Maybe. Well, one of the other things that I didn't agree with you on was this idea that the new gods are doing fine and not scared because the new gods are terrified. The new gods have seen other new gods live mm. much shorter lifespans than any of the old gods because of the rapid pace of modernization and globalization and technology and just the advancement of the species. So like it is mentioned that, you know, there was a train god in the 1800s when the trains were big and they crossed the, the world and they were, or they crossed the continent and were a major, you know, lifeline for the entire country. And as that declined, like, those gods died. Um, you, you're seeing the same kind of terror with a lot of the old god or a lot of the new gods, that they're worried that they are going to be obsolete any moment and they need to try and find a way that they can be changing with the times and continue yeah. to stay relevant. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I think for the new gods, the old gods are the specter of what they'll be like tomorrow. That's fair. And I mean, I think that there's an extent to which I think humans sort of act in a similar way towards the gods in that they're not 
their, their concern is what can I take from you? Sure. And have mostly given up because they've not been getting anything. Right. There's a very transactional perspective on both sides. I think, especially in American Gods, and maybe to a slightly lesser extent in Good Omens, I think in Good Omens, the gods are more just forgotten. But in American Gods, like I think that they're much less worshipped. I think the gods are much less what people are worshipping and more what people are obsessed over, either through it being a fad or it being a fear, like their, you know, tech and media and things. Whereas if you look at the older gods, they're, you know, the coming of the dawn and being able to make it through the winter and those sorts of obsessions instead. So as life has become more comfortable and tech has become more comfortable, it's not that these people are worshipping these things necessarily as that they're obsessed with them, mm. which... I think it becomes the ideas that are important to people. Yeah. That, I mean, and it is reiterated several times in American Gods that gods are pe gods are ideas. And like all ideas, they kind of wax and wane in their relevance uh, to a given society. I'm not sure how relevant that is to Good Omens. We're, we're talking too much about American Gods. <laughs> I mean, there's an extent to which I think it is. I mean, like, the horsemen... Oh, sure, definitely. Um, ...certainly have changed to adapt to people's growing fears, um, and they're sort of ignored to an extent. I think that the combination of pollution with the fact that one of the things that Adam changes is the nuclear power stuff, and mm -hmm. they've got the concern about the environment things... I think it does still tie in to an extent there. L less so because we get so little of people being worshipped in Good Omens. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I might just be arguing semantics, but it feels like they're much, it's much more creation of fear and desire than a type of worship as such. Like, I don't think people are devoted to these things there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Do you have anything else to add on the big question? Did we come up with an answer? I think it sounds like our the answer to our big question is that the nature of the relationship between humans and the divine is very transactional, mm -hmm. but it kind of mutates in its character based on the pressures of a time. Um, so in previous points in time, a lot of the pressures of humanity that people looked to gods and outside entities for help with were things like get surviving through the winter and you know escaping from predators and having enough food and things like that whereas now it's more about somewhat less tangible less direct survival things at least in industrialized nations and it's more things like how do i stay connected to other people? How do I stay entertained? How do I get the things that I want materially? Not necessarily, how do I not starve? Yeah. I think that's fair. So we dealt with the big question, but I think the bigger question that these books ask is, if you have divine power, what's the correct amount of time to spend fucking with humans? I really think that depends on the extent of how you're fucking with humans and whether you mean that literally, because the, if you mean it literally, the answer is none of that, none of the time, as we see by how totally messed up both Odin and Bilkis are. Because what the hell, guys? Not cool. People, consent is important, okay? Um, you know, coin tricks and stuff, fine. You know, the, there, has, there should be a setting where people are open to being toyed with, like, be a mentalist or something, but the charming women into sleeping with you or absorbing people into your vagina, like, that stuff's not okay. Yeah, I realize that asking that question just off of you talking about Odin's sexual prowess. Not was... prowess. <laughs> no. I, I put the air quotes up because no. we're on a podcast and that's the best no, way no, to no, do No, no, no. See, that implies skill or ability, and I have to think that a man who literally uses magical charms to make women want to sleep with him and predominantly does this with virgins probably doesn't have a lot of sexual prowess. Yeah, you might be right. But I mean, you know, like Crowley does the whole motorway thing and uh, that seems like fun. Until it sets fire to itself. Well, that wasn't necessarily his fault. Yes, it was. As the paintball thing. And he doesn't kill anyone, though. That's true. Yeah, that's true. 
I think that it really depends on what universe you're in and how dark it is. If you're in the American Gods universe, just don't. And if you're in the Good Omens universe, go on. It's all lighthearted. Like, it's like, what's the age that this is really intended for? If it would be reasonable for a 12-year-old to read it, sure, fine. Yeah. If it has a gatekeeping vagina absorbing scene that's really meant to make it really only uh, accessible to older, slightly darker people, then you probably shouldn't do any of it. Yeah. Okay, so now that we have addressed the bigger question. Fun facts? Yes. Who wants to go first with their fun facts? Well, I had some fun facts relevant to American Gods, and I believe you had some fun facts relevant to Good Omens. That seems about fair. Um, I think we've largely been doing Good Omens stuff first, so shall I go first? Sure. So, the story that Neil Gaiman originally started writing was a parody of the Just William stories by Richard Crompton, which I actually read a few of when I was a child, which are about a small child who gets into hilarious hijinks um, and gets in trouble for them a lot. One of the memorable ones is him complaining that people don't find it funny when he and his friends would wander around the museum and set, uh, comment on the fact of how, oh yes, you know, I'm just recovering from scarlet fever and the doctor said I should be at home, but I figured it would be fine, and then watching as everyone screams and runs away, because they were in a time when scarlet fever was a thing. But the parody that Neil Gaiman started writing was to be called William the Antichrist, which uh, I think he didn't end up straying too far from that, but it's fun. Uh, Good Omens was written at the same time that Gaiman was continually working on Sandman, which is why Pratchett ended up doing some more of the work. There's various discussions as to who wrote what parts. Pratchett takes claim for most of um, Agnes Nutter's life story, uh, but apparently Gaiman gleefully takes claim to the maggots. So thanks, Gaiman. <laughs> but they have also said that there are points at which they were reading things and thought that the other person who wrote it and the other person was like, no, I didn't write that. So it's just mysterious stuff that no one knows who wrote it. I'm just going to do these quick fire because apparently I have more fun facts than I ought to. Uh, the American edition um, adds some additional footnotes to explain Britishisms and also um, 700 additional words on what happened to Warlock, the child that got that ended up living with the American diplomats and was thought to be the Antichrist. Apparently Americans needed to know what happened to the one that was tied to the American side. <laughs> So the TV series was put together as part of a request from Pratchett short, uh, to Gaiman shortly before his death. Hmm. Interesting. And also the production company that, um, or one of the production companies that worked on it, Narrativia, was put together um, and is co-directed by Rihanna Pratchett, Terry Pratchett's daughter. Hmm. And when it was first founded, one of the things they said was we're going to work on an adaptation of Good Omens. The last Good Omens one, sorry to ramble on. They have plans for a sequel. This was plans years and years ago. Uh, it was going to be called 668, The Neighbor of the Beast. It was abandoned because Gaiman moved to the States and was too busy writing American Gods. But there is then a complete plan for a novel that Pratchett is in favor of, and that exists. And Gaiman has said that he might still do it if he has, depending on certain factors, including whether he has any time. So particularly with the success of the series, that might be something we see. Which could be fun. Can I do my one quick American Gods fact as long as I'm... Writing? I actually... what Your quick facts about Good Omens reminded me of a quick fact from Good Omens, but it's more relevant, relevant to the TV show. Apparently, because Terry Pratchett passed before the premiere of the Good Omens television show, they had his hat, which was like a signature, like iconic thing that he wore, on a chair designated for him in the premiere showing, which is very bittersweet. Yeah. So for the American God ones, which is... Pratchett related as well. One of the Discworld books is called Small Gods, and like there was some vague criticism that the creation of the gods in in American Gods is kind of similar to that. And Gaiman said that he never read the book, but that during the time that they were writing it, they were having extended phone calls talking to each other, and Terry Pratchett did actually help him sort out some of the plot elements. Interesting. So, um, they they sort of both worked on both books. Interesting. Two varying degrees. So, some fun facts about American Gods. Neil Gaiman envisaged Shadow as The Rock. Dwayne Johnson. I could I could see that. I think I'm happier with the one that they went with. Yeah, the guy that they cast in the adaptation, I think, was excellent. Whose uh, name we will insert here when we have remembered I'm not, yeah, but let's not get into that. Um, another fun fact, Shadow Moon's real name is Balder Moon. 
Huh. Um, this is alluded to in the book when Loki says he's going to kill Shadow by stabbing him in the eye with mistletoe, which is how Balder is killed in Norse myth. Hmm. Uh, Loki tricks another god into stabbing Balder with mistletoe. And the real name is confirmed in a follow-up no- novella called Monarch in the Glen, where Shadow Moon is going off having adventures. But yeah, his name is actually Balder Moon. Hmm. Balder was the favorite son of Odin. And was also uh, the child of his that he and his wife sacrificed to help. So it really does work in a lot of ways. Lovely. My favorite son, whom I will sacrifice for my own power. Trax? Gods um, are kind of dicks. Odin is kind of a dick. Let's see, one of the other fun facts I have is that there is a little Easter egg of delirium from Sandman in American Gods. Huh. She has a cameo at one point. She is described uh, with her multicolored hair and a dog on a leash that's really just a string tied around the dog, huh. and described very faithfully to how she appears in Sandman. I might have called that if I'd ever read Sandman. Very possibly. The last fun fact I have is that Loki Lysmith, who is Mr. World, who is Loki, is Shadow's cellmate, and in prison recommends that Shadow read Herodotus. Mm-hmm. Which seems kind of weird be- um, in terms of the guy that Loki Lysmith is pretending to be in prison. But it's actually an inside joke because a lot of historians refer to Herodotus as the father of lies because of how much creative license he took writing his histories. Oh. Yeah, so I just thought that was cute. Nice. Okay, I think that that's everything that we have on American Gods and Good Omens. We don't have any feedback from the last episode, because we haven't published it yet. Do we have any follow-up or late thoughts about The Shining from last week? I Nothing that I wanted to state so badly that I wrote it down or remembered it in any way. Okay, cool. Well, we won't say that then. Okay. What about you? I did have something. I can't remember what it was. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll move on from that. Maybe if you remember it in the next, before we record the next one, you can make a note of it and uh, we'll revisit it. Might do. Or it could just not be that important. Okay, so next week we're going to do something a little bit different. We're looking at, this is a podcast about stories and storytelling of all sorts. So next week our topic is going to be murder ballads. This means that there's going to be quite a few different songs that we're going to be talking about and looking at. And we're aware that not everyone is going to know all of those, because a week ago we didn't either. Um, We've created a couple of Spotify playlists. One is called Unrambling's Murder Ballads Expanded, which includes all the songs that we... Uh, listen to in preparation for the episode and there's another one which is just unrambling murder ballads which is just the ones that we actually talk about in the episode we're going to include a link to that in our show notes for this episode and also on our social media which you can find at facebook and instagram at unramblings and at twitter at unramblings pod if you have any questions or would like to correct us on something or you would like to tell us what and we should do an episode on at some point, you can contact us either through those three social media platforms with a direct message, or you can email us at unramblingspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to the Unramblings Podcast. We hope that you'll tune in next week.